Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, The Hartwig Family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, The Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. And welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckheads join me shortly in our topics this week. Clay won't go away. Long way to go until a new KCI emerges and not very long until the August primaries. Plus, of course, roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and focus on politics and government in Kansas. And joining me is a man who is deeply involved with both. He's Chris Kobach, the Kansas Secretary of State and one of the leading contenders in the GOP gubernatorial primary. Mr. Secretary, welcome to Ruckus. Thank you for joining us. Great to be with you, Mike. Good to see you again. You have been the driving force behind a Kansas law requiring proof of citizenship to register to vote. That's been overturned by a federal judge. What happens now? Uh, it, the case is being appealed to the Tenth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, and by the way, Kansas is one of four states that requires proof of citizenship. And really, I think all states should be doing this because there are so many non-citizens voting. But just to give you a sense of where this decision is coming from, uh, the judge, she ruled that it was unconstitutional for a state to require proof of citizenship. And that's a really big stretch, such a stretch that the Ninth Circuit, the crazy Ninth Circuit out in California, they were presented with that same argument 10 years ago in an Arizona case, and they didn't buy it. They rejected the idea that it was unconstitutional. So I, she, she's taken a pretty extreme view of the law, in my opinion. I think the Tenth Circuit is likely to overturn that holding. I certainly hope but so. But in the meantime, someone wants to register to vote yeah, for the in, first time in, can in, just go in and register? In the meantime, our proof of citizenship requirement is suspended. So you can just check the box, I'm a U.S. citizen, sign your name, and. And, and, and go on, and, and that was not Will stopping. Will anybody check after the fact? No, there's no meaningful way to check. Okay. The only way to, I mean, there, if we got external information then, which is very rare, you might be able to check, but that's the reason you need to have a, a, a process at the front end. All right, that federal judge, Julie Robinson, who overturned the voting law, sanctioned you and told you to go to six days of legal training to learn more about civil procedure. Is that as it struck me, an unusual action by a it's, judge? It's extremely unusual. I've never heard of that happening. Do you think before. you it deserve was, it was six that? six hours, not six days. <laughs> no, did I say six <laughs> days? Did. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. six hours. Yeah, uh, it's part of, well, we, we have annual CLE, yeah. continuing legal education, all attorneys do, and she gave me an extra six hours, but very strange. I've never heard of that. Do before. you think you deserve that sanction? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, your critics say that one of the things you talk about is vote fraud, and yet you have little evidence to prove that there is vote fraud. Do you have evidence of vote fraud? Tons of evidence. And the thing with the critics is they, they don't want photo ID. They don't want proof of citizenship. So as much evidence as you give them, it's never enough. We presented to the court 127 identifiable cases of aliens who either successfully registered or tried to register in Kansas. And our expert witness said the number could be higher than 33,000 because you only see the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, you, we present how, just a, how big the problem is, and the left will say, oh, that's not enough. You've got to show us more voter fraud before we take this problem seriously. Is there any amount of vote fraud that's acceptable? No, not in my book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, every time someone votes fraudulently, yeah, yeah. they cancel out your vote, they cancel out my vote. Kansas produced a budget surplus of $318 million in the fiscal year that just ended. Does that mean the increased income tax law worked or that taxpayers no. t paid too much or what, something else? What happened is the, uh, the revenues exceeded projections, and so the projections were flawed. Kansas is actually still in the dumps economically. We're 41st out of 50 in, in growth, and we were one of only three states that had negative growth in 2017. So it's not like our, revenue, our economy's roaring. It's, it's still in the tank. It just meant that the way they predicted the revenue was off. We should have never had that income tax hike, and I would have vetoed it. Uh, so if you become governor, you'll ask for an income tax cut? Yes, absolutely. Um, we Now that we're seeing that the, the shortfall that they thought was there isn't as great. And furthermore, we got the Trump tax cut, which created this windfall for the state. And it should have been passed on to uh, Kansas taxpayers, but it wasn't. So I'll be fighting for that. I'm the only candidate in this race, Mike, and I think this is unusual. I'm the only candidate in the Republican primary who has signed the no tax hike pledge. Normally. Everybody signs it. I think most analysts agree that you and Governor Collier are the top two contenders in the GOP gubernatorial race. Mm -hmm. Both Republicans, both call yourselves conservative. What would you say to voters is the quintessential difference? 
there are two big differences. One is that uh, Jeff is more of a tax and spend Republican. He just signed a $545 million spending increase. He won't pledge not to hike taxes. I, on the other hand, have said I would have vetoed that, and I am trying to cut taxes. So there's one big difference. The other big difference, I would say, is on illegal immigration. Uh, as you know, I've been fighting on that issue for many years, represented states like Arizona and, and cities like Fremont, Nebraska. Uh, and we're going to stop sanctuary cities. We're going to stop in-state tuition for legal aliens, require businesses to use E-Verify, uh, have better cooperation between the Highway Patrol and ICE. Collier, on the other hand, is more status quo. He had the opportunity to push for these bills in the last session, and he refu refused to do it. Very quickly, final question. Would you support the amendment to take away the Supreme Court of the state's ability to determine how much money is necessary for school finance? I would absolutely support that. Look, the decision about how much money to spend, whether it's on schools or anything else, belongs with the representatives of the people, not with unelected Mr. judges. Mr. Secretary, we have to stop it there. Thanks very much for coming in. Great to see you again. Good luck in the campaign. Thank you. My pleasure. That is Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Lisa Johnston is a consultant and columnist. Patrick Tui is director of municipal policy at the Show Me Institute, a free market think tank. John Stevens is the head of Rock Hill Strategic and Ron Freeman is a motivational speaker and writer. Welcome to all of you. It's great to have you in again. Thanks for coming by. Let us begin where we left off and talk about the race for governor in Kansas. As you know, Kobach and the current governor, Jeff Collier, are seen as the top competitors for the GOP gubernatorial nomination. Kobach is the Secretary of State and known nationally for his views on vote fraud and immigration issues. Collier is a plastic surgeon with prior legislative experience in Kansas. Both are known as conservatives assuming that one of them will win the primary on August the 7th. What will be the deciding factor for GOP voters? Let's start with Lisa. Well, they'll each have their own base of support, of course, and it's going to come down to those undecided voters or the persuadables. And in this case, I think that Kobach does have an advantage because he, in my opinion, is the more effective political communicator. He has a number of lines that, while I disagree with most of them, are very effective, like saying the court is asking for ransom uh, for education funding. He also usually has some appeals to emotion, he talks about his family, and he speaks in a way that's very passionate and energetic. And that usually is very persuasive. Collier, on the other hand, is more uh, composed and sedate, and that doesn't come across as quite as, as upbeat. So I think that for that reason, Kobach will have an advantage, and then also because the GOP primary electorate tends to favor a more conservative position, that's an advantage as well. Let me take this opportunity to mention that uh, we have invited Jeff Collier to be a guest on Ruckus on several occasions, I'm told, and each time there's either been no response or the response is no, so that's why we can talk to Kobach and not talk to Collier. We offered the opportunity. So, uh, Patrick, is Collier fairly described as the more establishment candidate? Well, he's he's been in office for a long time. He was lieutenant governor, but, but Kobach has been in office too. I, I suspect that really what this is, as Lisa said, is kind of just generating your ground game, getting your base out to support you. I think given the conservative nature of voters in Kansas, that probably does give Kobach an edge. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that it's necessarily a fine points on issues that are driving this election. It's going to be getting uh, getting out your voters. Well, what's the difference between the two? Uh, what, what's the policy difference? Well, I don't think there's, there's a large policy difference between the two, frankly. Um, I think it's all about style, and I, I agree with, with Patrick and Lisa both that I think in the primary, uh, Kobach has a distinct advantage because of his messaging and because of the, the voters that come out. I think what you're going to see, though, is, is are people getting tired of the caustic language, the caustic messaging, and, and will there be sort of a moderate pushback like we saw in the legislature of more of a moderate Republican? I think if that's the case, you might actually see a surprising... Uh, shift more towards a Collier that it was more sedate, sure. more, uh, I think, calm in his messaging. Well, after the hectic Brownback years, is it possible Republicans might say, we want to stay calm, I, we don't want the excitement, the change that's promised by Koba? I, I, I think so, and I think the, the, the policy messaging would be outweighed by the ability to actually accomplish anything in a legislature in Kansas as, as governor. I think that a, a Kobach governorship 
sets the stage for a mass amount of conflict and fighting and not getting a lot accomplished, which I think people were, grew very tired of under the Brownback years. Ron, uh, which of these two candidates do you think will get the most votes in Johnson County? I think that's a good question. Uh, well, you, of course. You have a, <laughs> well, you have a, why I asked them. That's that's all. All. My it's questions are. There's a reality that um, for the first time in a while, there's an opponent on the other side of the ledger, the Democrat, that, that is a credible candidate. And, and that so, would be Laura, Laura Kelly, Kelly. Who, by the way, is going to be a guest on Ruckus in a couple of weeks. And so one of the factors is going to be who's going to be the best person to run against her. And, and I think when you look at the bottom line, it's, you're going to have to have somebody who is more temperate who's um, less inflammatory and, and gives a party a chance to win an election. Now, I think Collier's stronghold is going to be the northeast corner of the state, and I think that outside of that, it's probably going to lean Kobach quite extensively. You well, you've, got a doc you've got a doctor and an attorney, and that's really what you're talking about here, personality-wise. Yeah. An attorney's coming at you, charge charging, and I think Collier's going to make hay about this whole court case with uh, voter fraud and all that. I mean, he's going to make. Well, a big it's deal a bill out that that, that Collier or that Kobach wrote, campaigned mm -hmm. for, exactly. got passed, and it got they overturned got in federal court, although it's on appeal. Yes, now. and so trust is going to be that big factor. I think that's going to be the one that tilts so, so Collier's favor. Lisa, you and the other panelists just watched. My talking to Kobach, does he seem like an extremist to you? Well, I think that he has some good points. I think he goes too far, in my personal opinion, on, on certain issues. I wouldn't say the court is asking for ransom, as I noted earlier, when it comes to education funding. Uh, but, you know, he has some charismatic appeal, and I think that that will definitely help him to get votes. Now, going back just briefly to John's point, about the bombast and uh, that dynamic, I think that Trump's approval rating in Kansas is pretty good. And yeah. since that's holding firm, I'm not sure that people are that and, tired. And, and very quickly, Lisa, got to wrap it up. Uh, what's the appeal of Senator Laura Kelly, the Democrat we're talking about? Well, like Ron said, she's a contrast. She is very experienced, long-serving mm -hmm. state senator. She is knowledgeable, dependable certainly qualified for the job, but the problem with Laura is that one of her strengths being kind of calm and tempered and serious is also going to be a liability in campaigning because she doesn't have that passion and energy. All right, speaking of calm and serious, Clay Chastain <laughs> first came to Kansas Cityans' attention in the 1980s calling for Union Station's restoration. Along the way, Chastain has proposed numerous light rail plans that have been rejected by others and by voters. Chastain has also run for mayor and lost on several occasions, each time vowing never to run again. Now he's breaking that vow again and running for mayor of Kansas City next year, claiming he is the only candidate who can beat Jason Kander, the former Missouri Secretary of State. Now, the election of Donald Trump in 2016 has likely changed the nation's political calculus. Old rules seem no longer to apply. So might this new political environment give Chastain an opportunity he has never had before? Patrick? Well, people have gotten used to voting against Clay Chastain <laughs> in Kansas City. But, but let me say this. To his credit, he is the only person who has gotten a streetcar or light rail uh, initiative passed citywide in Kansas City. The only one that ever passed, he put out. And I and of course you remember the city council then did away with it. Was it was in 2006. That's right. right. Yeah. And so uh, I suspect he's kind of got a nostalgia for that one win. Uh, but what's happened is, again, Kansas Cityans have gotten used to seeing his name and voting elsewhere. And I, I think that is a tough mountain to, uh, to overcome. The year that was approved by voters, the Chastain light rail plan, uh, I think Claire McCaskill was on the ballot that year and also uh, minimum wage in Missouri was on the ballot. Lots of people turned it out. It had been, right? streetcars and light rail had been defeated so many times leading up to that point that the would-be opponents to the measure said, don't bother, this isn't going yeah. anywhere, right. and it's the only time it passed. A and he, he's complained about the fact the council overturned Absolutely. the voters' uh, mm -hmm. views for, for the years that have intervened. Uh, do you think the fact that he has offered these light rail plans so many times and offering one this time called the Grand Great, the Grand, <laughs> see if I can, Grand Green Transit Plan, I believe. I mean, he's going to do that and run for mayor simultaneously, I guess. Uh, 
Yeah, no, he, I mean, he might as well propose rocket gondolas. I mean, it's... I, I think he has. Well, I think yeah, he probably yeah, has, yeah. actually. That, that, might be that may get more traction. Yeah. I, I, I think people have seen... <laughs> streetcar is actually on the ground and running now, and you know what? As, as Patrick said, uh, we can all look back with nostalgia that Clay Chastain was an early advocate of streetcar and light rail and whatnot. And Union Station. He, and Union I mean, Station, he, he was Historic as responsible as anybody for Union Station right. being restored. But, but he mean, has really become a punchline more than anything, I think, within the community. And it's time to, you know, move on. Well, he, I think he genuinely cares, though. I think he really does want the best for Kansas City, so they got that going. Well, for. let me ask you this, Ron. As I said in the lead-in, the rules seem to have changed about what's acceptable for political candidates. Right. We've never seen anybody like Donald Trump run for office and win. So do those changes have an effect on Chastain's possibilities? I think in a crowded field, anything's possible. Obviously, it's a long shot. What he's done, if you look at his campaign, he's... By creating the ballot initiative, he's, <clears throat> excuse me, he's put himself into that, this is what I do. So he's giving it his best shot. I mean, I think in terms of will he win it, not likely, but in a crowded field, who knows what could happen. Well, one of the continuing issues involving Chastain is he doesn't live in Kansas City. Yeah, well, there's that. Uh, he problem. apparently <laughs> has property here. He does pay right. property tax, some kinds of taxes in Kansas City, Missouri, and Jackson County, and has been ruled in the past yeah. eligible to run for office. Yeah. But you almost wonder why there's even going to be a campaign, because it seems that our civic leaders have decided Jason Kander is going to be elected mayor. Does he deserve that status this early? Well, he'll certainly be a strong candidate, and he certainly has some powerful, uh, visible backers, which is very good for him. I, I do find it interesting that Clay Chastain has gone on the record saying he's the only one that could beat Jason Kander, which I find flabbergasting because he couldn't even beat <laughs> Vincent Lee to get on the ballot. Well, I mean, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, his statement right. presumes that both he and Kander right. survived the primary. Right, right. Yeah. right, right. Now, the one thing we do know Clay Chastain can beat is a dead horse because he's been doing oh, that yes. for decades. Oh, yes. But like you all said, I mean, we have to give the guy credit. He's been persistent. But I think Kander will be a very strong contender. Well, Patrick, you watch all of this uh, very closely. Do you see other names on the potential mayoral ballot who uh, are strong contenders? Uh, well, first of all, we've been told by our political betters that Donald Trump could never be president. And, and I would push back on the idea that we've never seen a character like Donald Trump. I think Huey Long and Andrew Jackson are kind of populist uh, Well, we don't uh, remember disruptors. Andrew Jackson for the most part. Uh, we didn't see his campaign. <laughs> and uh, right. Huey I Long did. was in but the state, you, not national. <laughs> Andrew Jackson would have tweeted a lot. Uh, I'm sure he would have been <laughs> great. But Harry Truman, to some extent, was an outspoken president, but there was not the media coverage there is now. What the, what, what's interesting to me so far is that nobody in the field of, of mayoral candidates seems to be the opposition, right? But with the exception, perhaps, of, of Chastain. Everybody, I think, has just got four more years of what we've got, or the, the you know, years and years more of kind of uh, Barnes and James, which is we're going to continue to develop downtown, we're going to spend a bunch of money on wealthy white people. Uh, I would like to see a candidate that come out and say, no, what we've done for these past four, eight, twelve years is wrong. We're not helping the city. We're wasting a great deal of money and building debt, and we need to go a different way. And so far, I don't see anybody well, doing that. Well, since many of them I, running are on the city council right. and were part exactly. of whatever right. happened the last four, eight, and 12 years, they, so it it's a matter of difficult pick, for them. I actually would disagree Maybe a little bit. I, door. I would say Phil Glenn has actually tried to gain a little bit of message. And who is he? He's the he, he's Crossroads he's business district? Crossroads right. businessman who, who announced relatively early right. in the process. I, I, he hasn't gained a lot of traction in that message. I don't think people are picking that up. But he, he has consistently said, we need to look to the east side. We need to look at substantial reforms of TIF policies and of other you know, incentive policies. He's not getting a lot of traction in that, where I think the, the rest of the candidates are sort of lining up against candor and maybe sniping at each other. Now let's get back to the <laughs> now let's get back to the mainstream. Activist organizations <laughs> have a tough time staying silent after they lose a fight. Citizens for Responsible Government (CFRG) wanted to keep the current KCI configuration, <laughs> but Kansas Cityans thought otherwise and voted for a new one-terminal airport. Since the election, however, we have learned the airport's opening will be delayed about a year. There will be more gates and the total cost will increase. According to Tony's Kansas City, CFRG is calling for a new plan, keep, remodel, and enlarge the existing terminals, add amenities, connect the two terminals, and house 25 gates in each. CFRG calls for, and I quote, someone with common sense to step up and get this right. 
So does the CFRG plan seem like common sense to John Stevens? No, I, w I wish CFRG would, would gain some common sense. This, there is a lot to be said, a lot of discussions to be had about the Edgemore process, about the delays, about the costs. Those are legitimate questions that need to be asked. People need to be continually pushing on that. Uh, but their idea of going back and reversing time in some manner where the airlines and everyone have clearly said these terminals do not work, the cost, the structures do not work, this is, it, it's just silly that they're trying to look at this. I, I think there are legitimate questions to be asked and there is a role for organizations like CFRG to sort of be there, to be a, 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 uh, an organization that raises red flags and pokes at, at the government. But this is not the way to do it. This is silly. Patrick, is it even possible to stop the KCI plan that's now apparently in development? Sure. I, I, you know, the city hall always wants to tell us, too late. We can't do it. We're locked into contracts. We, we've, sure, we made a bad uh, decision years ago, but we've got to plow forward with it now. I think that's garbage. I think the aviation department under its last two directors have proven itself to be absolutely inept when it comes to the airport. Mark Van Lowe did not know that the state of Missouri required a public vote on bonds. Patrick Klein didn't know that the FAA required that the environmental analysis be completed before you got, got before you started construction. Our city manager and our mayor came out and said in front of cameras that they wanted to make a no-bid billion dollar contract uh, awarded to, uh, to Burns and Mack. Nobody in this process comes out and looks good. And somebody, thankfully, has got to come out and say, well, we've got to do better. Given all the problems thus far with the airport, would it have made sense to go with a local contractor? Oh, I don't think Burns and Mack would have been any more able in fact, I suspect, given their past, Burns and Mack would have tried to fleece the city more. Who would pay for this CFRG project were it come to fruition? Uh, the airlines have said they'll pay for one terminal airport, a new one, but they're not going to pay for uh, remodeling. Well, I assume that the intent would be for to for the Excellent. cost to be passed on to flyers in the same way that it is now. Although, like you say, the airlines would certainly push back because they have decided they want the new airport. Now, I certainly understand the argument that CFRG has made because I wasn't a huge advocate of building the new airport either. But I think at this point, barring a catastrophe, the mayor and the allies of new K KCI are fully behind this. And if anything, I think they would switch a vendor but not scale back all the We've way to a remodel. We've got a catastrophe on our hands. It's a mess. Really? We sold the voted to bill of goods, <clears throat> didn't follow through, and now who's going to pick up the tab? Let me ask you a question. Whether you agree with CFRG on this or not, do organizations such as Citizens for Responsible Government serve a legitimate purpose in Kansas City and throughout the country? Well, I think calling public attention to issues, absolutely. Sure. You agree with that? I, no, I agree. I, I think that they're... They're taking an approach that is wrong, but but their purpose and the purpose of an organization like that is absolutely, it's, it's vital in public discourse. Let me echo something that Crosby Kemper said on the show a few weeks ago, which is so many civic organizations like the Civic Council, the Chamber of Commerce, have been absolutely absent from important issues in Kansas City and Jackson County. They just don't step forward. We've got something in Kansas City called Kansas City Nice, where everybody sees a bad idea, yeah, I absolutely but nobody, agree with stand, that. nobody stands up and says true. so. And when you find people that do stand up and say so, they ought to be applauded for it. I How do you join Kansas City? City nice. <laughs> I, think, I think we're bored into it. I think I've been excluded. Socialized. <laughs> Why won't they let me in? <laughs> All right, now we're going to have to head to the soapbox for roast and toast where the ruckheads have 30 seconds each to contemplate, mm. obviate, or vitiate. <laughs> and we start with Lisa. What do Michael Dukakis, Al Gore, John Kerry, and Hillary Clinton all have in common? They were strong resume candidates that lacked significant political charisma. My roast is for those who fail to realize that voters often respond more to the person than to the resume. Like it or not, charisma is absolutely essential to win high-profile competitive races. And putting a resume-only candidate in front of voters is about as effective as giving someone who tells you they're craving chocolate a pile of steamed broccoli. <laughs> All right, John. Wow. Um, <coughs> I, I want to give a rare, very rare toast to the U.S. House of Representatives for rejecting the Grotham Amendment, which would have stripped the NEA and the NEH of funding and uh, moving that forward. And, and, and NEA, National Education Association. Uh, National yeah. Endowment for the Arts and National oh, okay. Endowment for the Humanities. Okay. Uh, and, and that would have stripped them of, the, of their funding and preserving arts and humanities as something important to the citizens and to the electorate. All right, Patrick. 
Uh, a happy birthday toast today to uh, the late, great liberal senator uh, George McGovern, born today in 1922. McGovern said later in life that he uh, regretted that he did not know enough about business and the challenges that business people faced and he would have been a better candidate and presidential uh, candidate if he, had, if he had known those things. One wonders what he would say today about his party where they demand higher taxes, regulation and cheer the socialists among them. All right, Ron. Okay. Um, I have a <clears throat> rose for President Trump. Uh, Mr. President, I respect you as a leader of our nation. However, when you go abroad, you need to back us as a country, our nation. We deserve that, and you can do better. I liked it when you look at, looked at me and said, Mr. President. That was, <laughs> was, was kind of nice. All right, uh, finally, here is some advice, if you don't mind my giving it. If you're being interviewed on television in your home, don't let your cat be in the room with you. <laughs> Here's why. If uh, in every K position of the state, uh, the representative of the ancient communist uh, uh, secret services. That's an orange tabby, by the way. <laughs> Polish historian Jerry Forgalski, <laughs> whose appearance was clearly catastrophic. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.